today. Perfect. All right, it seems like a few people have joined. So before we get started today, I would just like to do a welcome to country um, talk. So firstly, I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Gunai Kurnai people, the traditional custodians of the land in which I am presenting to you from today. The Moreland City Library acknowledged the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people as the traditional custodians of the land and waterways in the area known as Moreland. We pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, as well as all First Nations communities who contribute to life in the area. So hello, my name is Georgia. Um, I'm coming to you live today to talk about summer pet safety. Um, my name is Georgia. I'm from Canine Snake Avoidance Victoria. So what basically what we do um, is we train dogs to stay away from snakes and stay safe around the snakes. So we've got a little bit to get through today. So feel free to uh, leave some comments. Um, I'll be having a read through them as we go along and I'm definitely willing to answer all the questions um, put in there. So I'll be keeping an eye on those <laughs> throughout the talk. Wonderful. So firstly, my name, who am I? My name's Georgia. I have been running this business since 2017. Um, and in that time I've trained about 500 dogs in snake avoidance. Um, so far, <laughs> hello, and um, it's so it's been quite a few dogs that we've trained, which is, I'm very privileged and I feel very proud of. Um, but I'm also a qualified veterinary nurse. Um, I've been a vet nurse for about six years now, going on, um, and as well as before being a vet nurse, I actually completed um, my bachelor in of archaeology. Actually, so I focused on studying animal dom domestication. Um, and human evolution. So I basically studied pet ownership from the get-go. <laughs> so the get-go of us domesticating dogs and, and things like that, and now obviously studying to focus and, and, and work with um, companion animals as they are today. So um, as a vet nurse, and I'm located out in Gippsland um, area, but I have worked in quite a few areas of Victoria as a vet nurse as well. Obviously seen my fair share of snake bites, um, which is the biggest concern I think for pet owners this time of year. Obviously we've had a few hot days, um, you know, very recently, today not so much, but the last two days in particular were very hot. Um, and myself finishing work last night at the vet clinic I worked at, we had a snake bite come through the door just as we were leaving um, a dog. So we stayed back to look after him and things like that. So they're definitely around and snake bites are definitely happening, you know, as we speak, so to say. Um, so it's definitely a big concern. Um, you know, along with other things that we have throughout the summer, such as heat stress, heat stroke, um, and things like that as well. So it's definitely a time of year where we're all wanting to go out and enjoy the environment. You know, luckily now with the COVID restrictions changing, we can, um, but it's nice because we can take our dogs and we can go, you know, out camping or go out in the park and things like that. Um, but so do snakes. <laughs> so I think uh, what we'll start off the, the chat with is I would like to talk about a little bit of snake biology, um, you know, snake behavior and things like that. So in Victoria, uh, we are, you know, lucky, unlucky to, depending on who you talk to and, and their interest in snakes. Um, we have kind of the big four um, being the elapids, so the venomous snakes that we find in Victoria. Generally, we refer to them as, you know, the elapids, um, they're front fang venomous snakes. So we have our red bellies, our tiger snakes, um, our brown snakes, and our copperheads. Um, you know, unfortunately, they, these guys, in, in terms of venom potency and yield, are very high. Um, so when snake bites do occur, it's it's a pretty serious deal. So um, things like that. <laughs> yeah. So our snakes are coming out at the moment. It seems to have been, um, from a veterinary point of view, a slow start to the, st the snake bite season in, in Gippsland, I guess it is as well, um, in particular. And we have only just been seeing kind of 
snake bites in the last few weeks. Previous years, we have had snake bites earlier in, you know, coming from, from August onwards um, when they start emerging a little bit more. Um, but for whatever reason, environmental or maybe it's just the fact that people are only allowed to be out and about now because of COVID, that we're seeing it happening now. Uh, you know, could, could be a range of those factors. We're, we don't really know at the moment, but, um, you know, so our snakes are active at the moment, the, the weather's warm and things like that. However, there there is a few kind of misconceptions um, and ideas about snakes and things that have been passed down for generation, which aren't necessarily correct. So the biggest one being our, our snakes hibernating um, throughout winter. So, you know, if we're looking at winter being kind of a start of a cycle, it's obviously colder and things like that. Now, our Victorian snakes and Australian snakes in general don't um, hibernate as if they would, you know, with um, other snakes across the world. They don't, you know, full shut down and reduce their temperature and heart rate and things like that. They kind of just are less active, um, you know, being an ectothermic animal, they require the external environment to heat their body. So as the environment's cooler, they're staying cooler. However, we do find, you know, going into a nice warm wintry day where a little bit of sun will come out, they'll come out and have a bask as well. They'll definitely take advantage of that warm weather as we do as well. So we have seen snake bites in winter. Um, you know, it's not common and it doesn't happen often, but it, it's definitely um, possible. So coming into spring, starting kind of August and, and moving along into those kind of, you know, end of the year kind of months, that's when our snakes start getting active as the, as the weather starts warming up, but also the, the night day cycle changes around a little bit too. So they'll start to sense that um, and their natural rhythm will kind of kick in at that point and they'll come out, start eating again, start, start getting, you know, a, a good meal down in preparation for breeding season and then kind of going forward um, into the, the hotter months where they're going to lay their bait, um, have their live young or egg, depending on um, the snake. And yeah, then going from there. Um, sorry, question from Jessa there. So when during the day are the snakes most active? Um, that's a fantastic question. And again, kind of leading on from our um, kind of environmental ectotherms, most on a hot day, yesterday is a fantastic example. You'll see them very active during the early morning um, and then into the afternoon. So during the peak heat of the day where it's 30 plus degrees, no one wants to be out, including snakes. Um, you know, believe it or not, they actually don't enjoy baking heat. They can't actually handle that very well at all. You'll definitely still see them, you know, darting through, but they'll probably try to find somewhere to hide. Um, and then you'll find as the, the day cools down, you know, kind of heading towards four or five o'clock, um, that kind of time where the sun's starting to set, but it's not quite, you know, cold just yet but the ground is still nice and warm. Hello. Um, the ground is nice and warm. You know, if you've got big rocks and things around or gravel, things on the ground like that, your snakes will come out and really soak in that heat, you know, under their belly and things like that. Um, that's when as a veterinary professional in the vet clinic, that's when we get the snake bites, hence the one yesterday. Um, you know, just as you lock it up, getting ready to go home, you get the phone calls and, you know, they're normally one or two scenarios, um, obviously various others, but these are the two common ones you hear. Number one being, I've just come home from work. There's a dead snake in my backyard and my dog's not looking very good. So obviously the immediate answer then is get here, you know, get to the vet clinic as soon as possible, get the dog in the car and just get to the clinic. Um, you know, in fact, put the dog in the car, as soon as you see that happen, call the clinic as you're driving there and tell them I'm coming down. I think my dog's been bitten by a snake. Um, if it is safe, it's not necessary, but if it is safe, you know, take a photo of the snake from a safe distance. If it is, you know, still there, um, that will help, you know, vets in terms of things of identifying the snake. However, the anti-venom that we use um, in a vet clinic is a multi kind of cocktail, I suppose, of anti venine So it will treat multiple species. It will pretty much treat, you know, your big four. Um, another question. Yeah, so 
Definitely, yeah, October to April is is definitely your, your peak snake season, um, but it's still something to keep in the back of your mind, you know, during um, during the winter as well. It's very unlikely, but it's definitely, I don't want to say you'll never see one during the winter, um, Tom, but yeah, definitely. Um, October to April, be on alert, keep your dogs on the lead, um, you know, if you're out and about. Um, there's nothing worse than even if your dog's got, you know, bomb proof recall or, or, you know, everything like that. If they're finding something and they're off in front of you and, and you don't see them, um, it takes a split second, you know, for a bite to happen. So, um, but just, I digress, um, but going away from our, our scenarios and things of what we see in, in vet clinics, um, basically is that I've come home, things like that. And another one, which is, a big one to look out for, um, which is similar to if you're out near the creeks um, and things like that as well, is you've got your dog, say they're off lead and they're having a run through a paddock or the bush or near the creek, somewhere like that, and you see your dog collapse and get up, be a little bit staggery and vomit. Those two symptoms, as soon as we hear that, if someone gives us a call and says, you know, I've just been out in the, in the yard and my dog's collapsed and then he's got up and he's vomited, um, the first thing you think in your brain is snake bite. Um, so those two things, a collapse and then a vomit, um, you know, can be followed by quite a few other symptoms. They're the things that we need to be getting to the clinic, you know, immediately, basically. Generally speaking, uh, from a veterinary point of view, pretty much say if you've been bitten or a dog's been bitten by a tiger snake, for example, um, very prominent in the moorland area, but um, tiger snake, you essentially have for your dog, unfortunately, has about 30 minute window from bite to getting an IV in and getting antivenin being administered. So it's a very short window of you know opportunity. Obviously, it varies on quite a few factors, such as the location of the bite, how much venom has actually been kind of injected at the time, um, you know, and, and the size of the animal and, and all these kind of different variables. But generally speaking, we have 30 minutes. So that's why if you can get in the car as soon as possible, um, you know, call the clinic ahead, A, to make sure that they have antivenin on hand. It's very unlikely that this time of year a vet clinic isn't going to have antivenin on hand, but if you are in, you know, a particular area and you have, you know, some vets that you know are around, might even be worth just giving them a call in the lead up to summer and just asking, hey, just wanting to know if you have antivenin in stock regularly, um, just so you know, you know, that you can go straight there and they're going to be ready for you. Another question from Jessa. Um, are, thing, uh, are there things I can do to keep snakes out of my yard and away from the house? Yes, there certainly are. Um, so the biggest kind of things that you need to be doing around your yard this time of year, you know, or even in the preparation to summer, so your spring, you know, springtime, things like that, is do a really good, you know, spring clean, I guess, of your yard, clearing away, you know, any dead leaf litter, any anything like that that's really laying around. If you've got shrubs, try and cut a good chunk away from the base of the tree. Um, if you've got, you know, old tin, or just things like that, your wood piles and things like that. You know, snakes like small spaces that they can kind of get into. They like being snug and tight. They don't like being in a big open area. So if you think about, you know, small areas that they might hide in or hide under, remove those. <laughs> so, you know, they like, you know, short grass. If you can get your grass and keep it really nice and short too, um, that's a perfect thing to do. If you're thinking about a snake um, from their kind of point of view, when they're on the ground, they're, you know, this far off the ground. They're very, very small, you know, kind of size. Um, so if your grass is nice and short, where they're going to be a lot more exposed when they're traveling through, that leaves them, you know, vulnerable to predators like, you know, whether it be kookaburras, eagles, dogs, unfortunately, um, you know, and things like that. So they're going to try and, you know, kind of find their way around areas that are closed off and, and sneaky that they can hide around. 
Um, another big thing that we do see as well, which is a little bit trickier than keeping it clear, but if you can, water sources. So on a really hot day, I can remember back to being a tiny little, tiny little one growing up in um, your kind of outer Gippsland area. Um, we had a little, little tiger snake um, come to our very back door and was essentially drinking out of the dog water bowl. So on a scorching hot day, and this was around night time, scorching hot day, they'll pretty much come and they're going to try and find water. They, they love a drink, you know, they love to have a drink. They definitely can go a while without having a drink, but if there's access to water and it's hot, they are going to have a drink. So if you can keep, you know, water bowls or things like that to a minimal, don't have lots of, you know, water around if possible. It's very hard, but that's one thing just to be conscious of as well. Pools, um, ponds, you know, those kind of things as well. Anything that attracts, you know, little frogs or little things like that, that snakes like to eat. Um, so your dams, um, you know, depending on where you live and things like that as well, that, you know, to keep those areas, if you can kind of keep your animals away from them um, and just be vigilant when you are going out, you know, maybe put some gum boots on before you go to take the bins out, things like that, instead of putting your thongs on, um, is always a good idea as well. So um, there's different things, you know, that you hear about the snake nettings and things like that. Um, that definitely, you know, a good idea, especially if you've got, you know, a, a particular dog yard that you, you know, kind of confine them to putting that, it's really fine netting, thick wire, be careful of using um, that really loose kind of bird netting. Snakes can in fact get in there, get tangled in, and then they're, you know, really, really stressed, really, it's, it's a real issue trying to get them out of those um, nets. They can get stuck, they'll die. Um, but more importantly, it puts you in a lot of danger if your dogs are near there, they're wriggling around trying to get out, really stressed, and that's when they're likely to just lash out. You know, it's like if you've got a, a really stressed animal, uh, that's when they're gonna say, ah, you know, just get away from me kind of thing when they're trying to help themselves. So if you can use that really thick um, wire mesh, that's a good idea with the tiny little holes in it. But something to keep in mind about those is unfortunately, while they're good at keeping snakes out, if the snakes do happen to get into the yard, it is harder for them to get out. So that's something to just be conscious of as well when putting those um, the, the netting around your area as well. But um, it, is, it is a good idea. Generally speaking, your venomous snakes aren't going to be climbing. There's definitely instances where they have and they can, um, but they're more, you know, they're more likely to just be like traveling along the ground and they just kind of know their way along. But um, it's definitely happened. So, you know, something to look out for. Uh, another common one we hear about, you know, keeping animals out of the yards are the uh, snake repellers. Maybe don't worry about those. <laughs> That's all I'll leave with those. They're not very effective. Um, and a question from Jessa, who should I contact if I have a snake in my home? That's a fantastic question. And that's another one similar to asking the vet if they have antibenine. Um, is having a look on Facebook or Google or, or whatever area you're in of local snake catchers. So snake catchers, like the name, they're gonna come and catch the snake. Um, but essentially they're, you know, they're different people in different areas licensed through um, the wildlife department like myself. Um, and they are a different license to what we have, obviously being the controllers, but they, you pretty much call them up, tell them I've got a snake. Um, and hopefully if they're available, they'll be able to come out, collect it and relocate it. So they'll just take it away somewhere that's a lot safer for it to be. Um, but you know, happy snake, happy family, not having the snake around. Um, when you do call a snake catcher though, things to just be in mind of, um, if you do have, you know, you know your local snake catcher, have him on speed dial, you know, have, have the number in your phone um, because snakes don't generally tend to hang around very long. Um, they're off, they're gonna be off very, very quickly, um, you know, if they are startled and things like that. So if they're obviously stuck somewhere, that's another question. But um, keep an eye on the snake as you're calling the snake catcher. So say if he's, you know, in a particular area of the yard, say there's a snake in the backyard, um, I'm, you know, obviously from a safe distance, keep an eye on the snake 
um, as the snake catcher is coming to you because it happens very often. Snake catchers will, will head out to your, you know, your area, they'll get there and the snake's gone. So, um, but they're, you know, worth their weight in gold in, in terms of having that number saved to your phone, um, even just asking information as well. Definitely been times um, in our local area where, you know, we've got the local snake catcher's number and we find out that a dog's been bitten by a snake um, you know, for, yeah, in the vet clinic um, in a particular area um, and where, you know, the snake's not looking great but the owner hasn't seen the snake, we'll even send a message to the snake catcher and say, hey, you know, we've had a, a dog bitten by a snake in um, for our area of Gippsland, your lawn north. What snakes do you commonly catch around that area? Um, and they might say to us, oh, that area is tiger snake area. So then that just gives us a little bit of an idea of, okay, you know, what we're dealing with. Obviously, it's not. 100%, but it's, you know, generally speaking, snakes have certain areas that they, they like, the little niches of the environment that fit best for them. So, um, yeah, in terms of getting and, and, you know, you've seen your dog being bitten by a snake, there's definitely very similar symptoms that we look out for when we're looking, we're looking to hear it, when you hear it on the phone or when we're, you know, triaging them when they come in clinic. Uh, but as a pet owner, there's you know, quite a few very clear signs to look out for. As I mentioned before, you know, we see our collapse and our vomit. They are our initial, initial things that happen very quickly post-bite. Um, you all, it, it's almost a, a, little, a little mountain um, if they've had quite a critical bite. So you'll see them collapse and vomit, and then they'll come up and they'll actually look okay for a little bit. We refer to this section as a false recovery. Because the owners will think, oh, actually, no, no, he's, he's looking okay now. And then they're going to drop. Then they're going to crash. And then we're in critical state right there. And that's when we need to be, you know, ventilating and, and doing all these, all kinds of things um, that are, you know, very, very, um, you know, complex to be treating. So if they haven't had that critical dose yet or things like that of venom, um, other things to be looking out for is, you know, excessive panting. They'll be, you know, panting a lot, but just laying there. Um, salivating, so drooling excessively. Like they'll be, it'll be pulling out of their mouth essentially. If you lift their gum up and have a look at the colour in their gum here, they might be very pale, um, very pale there. And it'll be just full of fluid, um, essentially full of drool. Um, and the pupils, uh, pupils of the dogs are a, or cat, um, are a thing to be looking out for. So essentially, obviously, if we're, you know, covering our eyes, our pupils are going to react to that sunlight or the, the artificial light or whatever we're looking at it. So obviously going smaller when the light's there, and then when there's less light, they're going to be going bigger. Now, when we see our dogs that are being bitten by snakes, however, their pupils will be fully dilated and if you cover the, you know, if you cover your dog's eye and then remove a, you know, produce a bit of light, it's not going to respond. So the pupils are just going to stay open the whole time. The dog almost looks, um, they look a little bit glassy as well. So those things combined uh, get to the clinic, you know, snake bite pretty clear, um, unfortunately. So once we're in clinic, obviously every clinic, you know, does things differently and, and things like that. And that, that's a conversation, you know, once you get there to be having with the vet that you're seeing at the time in terms of pricing and things. Um, but generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, um, in, in terms of talking finances, which is obviously a really difficult thing to talk about, but it is an important thing to know as well. Um, when we're dealing with snake bites, because it's such a serious and a real critical state that we're in, you know, we're talking, we need to be giving them antihistamine injections, we need to be giving them maybe multiple vials of antivenom. So an antivenom vial for, you know, a vet clinic to order in, you're looking at about, you know, a thousand dollars. So that price onto you. Some dogs, you know, we've had cases in the past where I've treated a dog that needed four vials of antivenom, you know, so mixed with fluids, you know, overnight care, monitoring, and in extreme cases, dogs are needing to be ventilated to get through the, um, the envenomation. So these things all combined, obviously, are, you know, essentially like, you know, what you see on TV of, you know, COVID 
related things, ventilators in their mouth, artificially breathing for them. These things happen from a snake bite. Um, they get a paralysis, you know, in the, di in the diaphragm, in the lungs and in the esophagus and things like that. And they're, and they're needing to be ventilated to breathe. Um, so you're looking at thousands, um, you know, minimum 2,000 to treat a dog for a snake bite. Um, obviously, it varies where you are um, and things like that. But yeah, roughly. So if we can avoid these things happening in the first place, that's the goal. <laughs> you know, I don't want to see the dog coming in for a snake bite at the vet. It's, um, you know, it's an awful thing to see from an owner point of view and for us. Like, we don't want to see them in pain and, and things like that. So that's the reason why I do what I do. Um, you know, doing the snake avoidance training um, means that we can train dogs in the first place to be able to recognize a snake and know to, to stay away from it. Um, Obviously, when you're looking at a domestication point of view from dogs, they've been domesticated down through time um, as whether it be hunting assistance, you know, and, and generally speaking, that was the first kind of point of um, domestication for dogs were assistance in hunting and things like that. So when we're talking about dogs having prey drive, it's it's ingrained and it's a it's along the line um, of them. Obviously, breed dependent now. You know, we have some breeds like um, companion breeds like pugs and things like that. But generally speaking, if you've got a kelpie or a border collie or you know a real working breed mix or a terrier, they're the big ones. Um, they're you know dealing with you know they they just see something and they and they're going to go for it. So that depending on you know the level of prey drive where it's to catch or it's to um to chase it or herd it or things like that that gets the stakes back up so um tom a question from tom do all vet clinics carry snake anti-venom um it's hard to say i always suggest calling a clinic ahead um calling them to just ask if they do i have haven't worked in a clinic that doesn't have anti-venom um, but to say that it's very expensive for a vet clinic to order in. So if it's a clinic in an area that, you know, generally doesn't see snake bites, it might not be beneficial for them to have it on hand. Um, being in a country clinic where I am, we have it by the bucket loads um, ready to go because we see snake bites so often. But definitely call your clinics. Um, if you have a regular clinic that you go to or if you're traveling somewhere um, and you know, just having the number of that vet in your phone, give them a call, ask them, you know, do you have anti-venom? Um, just to know, because when it happens, the yeah, you know, you, you're essentially in shock and you're just gonna wanna get straight to the vet. Um, you're not gonna be thinking. And obviously the last thing you want is you get there and you rock up on the doorstep with your animal and they say, oh, sorry, we don't have anti-venom. We'll have to get someone to go get it, you know, from somewhere else. So, um, that's, you know, definitely um, a, a thing worth checking into first, for sure. So, um, yeah, but hopefully avoiding all of this um, is the whole concept of snake avoidance um, and snake avoidance training and teaching dogs not to go near them in the first place. Um, and so I've been doing this since 2017. So the birth, I guess, of canine snake avoidance Victoria for me was... Uh, working in a country vet clinic, uh, we had over summer just snake bite upon snake bite. Um, you know, you'd basically have one in and it would recover and you'd send it home and another one would come in. I remember one Saturday we had three snake bites coming in the same day. Um, and from, you know, a, from a limited like country practice, it, it's so hard for us. We didn't have, you know, access to 24 hour care. So we were staying back ventilating dogs manually because we didn't have a ventilator um you know not like the emergency centers um which if you're in the moorland area you're lucky to be nearby so um things like that um and pretty much was just thinking i think an owner at some point you know we were out with you know treating a dog and and the owner said to me oh it'd be good if you know we could train them to stay away um, so essentially that's how it began, the research phase and things learning how to do that. Um, so Jess has asked, what other hazards do we need to look out for in summer? Is there any help I can give my injured animal at home? 
Um, which is, yes, <laughs> summer is the busy season. Um, we get inundated with multiple things. Everyone's just out and about doing things. Um, I always suggest keeping a little pet first aid kit handy, um, you know, with just some basic things like bandages and things like that, that if your dog does get a cut, if it's running around and you're taking him out for a run at the, you know, the beach or something like that, and he gets a cut up his leg, you know, something just to put a little bit of pressure to stop the bleeding before you can get to the vet clinic. Um, and things like that are always really handy. Um, other hazards that we see during the summer, a big one which was a big concern just the past few days was heat stroke. Um, so, you know, in days where there's serious heat, if we don't want to be outside, as much as our dogs think that they want to be outside, it is not good for them to be outside. So a good rule of thumb is if you put your hand on the pavement and you can't hold it there for longer than a few seconds, like it's too hot, you're holding it there, you're thinking, oh gosh, that's really going to hurt, your dog's paw pads are going to burn. Um, so, you know, try to reduce your walking and only reduce, you know, only walk during, you know, early morning and in the afternoon. Keeping in mind that's when our snakes are out as well. So um, keeping them on a lead, keep some close by to you, keep your eyes on them just so you can, you know, keep a good look for them. Um, depending if you're traveling, you know, east, eastern Victoria, if you're heading, you know, out to Lake Centrance um, or those areas that are out towards the coast and the east coast, a good thing to be um, mindful of as well are paralysis ticks. We do see a lot of cases of paralysis tick, even if you don't live in those areas, but if you're traveling out there, um, you know, keeping an idea on what's going on, looking out for these. So there's lots of different um, parasite control that you can give to your dog before you head out anywhere like the bush um, or the lakes or things like that where paralysis ticks are found. Um, you know, there's chewable tablets, things called Nexgard um, and Brevecto are two products which will treat um, and prevent your paralysis ticks kind of latching on is something um, to chat to a vet about um, and get to give before you head out there. Um, so we see things like that, but this time of year we just see, you know, many strange things happening um, in terms of dogs, you know, running around and falling over and, and hurting themselves, breaking their legs, things like that. So um, it's normally yeah, pretty crazy, but a pet first aid kit, if you can have it, is very handy. Um, and just knowing what to do in an event of an emergency, where your closest clinic is and how to get there is the biggest thing. Um, you know, even if you're able to hold on to, you know, certain things, sorry, my cat just jumped on the bench. Um, if you're able to have, um, you know, like a syringe and things, if you may need to give them a little bit of water, um, but it's best not to, if you are going to the vet, if they've had something wrong with them, we've got a few, uh, oh, thank you everyone sharing, um, the link to the business page in the comments just there. So. That is perfect. Thank you for that, Beck. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so a good thing to talk about, I guess, is um, people, if you've got any questions um, now that we have our business linked in those comments there, got any questions in terms of um, the snake avoidance training um, and things like that, um, definitely send us a message on that page or an email um, to the email on the Facebook page. Um, I'll be able to reply to you and things like that in terms of um, booking your dog in. Generally speaking, that we travel all across Victoria, um, as the name states, and we come out to, um, to your house to train your dog in their environment. Um, and that way, when I'm there, you know, or we're there, we can, we can have a look at your area and give you a few tips as well in terms of snakes and where they might be um, in your yard and, and what to expect around. Um, as well as giving you a little bit of uh, pet first aid information as well. So basic information in knowing uh, what to look out for in the event of a snake bite or an urgent kind of matter. Um, a good one that I mentioned having some bandages and things on hand. So that's more for, you know, if they've got a laceration or a cut or something, you know, like that. Now, 
when we're talking about snake bite first aid and things that we see commonly happening with animals um, when they've been bitten by a snake, we it's very hard for us to identify this, the actual bite site. So when a human um, is bitten by a snake, there's a you know really um, you know, a wonderful first aid um, around in Australia in terms of treating snake bites. You know we we know where you know say where you are, and in terms of bandaging and immobilizing the limb. Now, unfortunately, with our dogs, they have such thick fur um, that it is very rare that you are ever going to see where the actual bite it is. So do not waste time trying to bandage a leg and compress, you know, compress bandage a leg. It's not effective. If anything, it's going to stress the dog out. It's going to take more time away from you getting somewhere and it's going to cause venom to start moving around the system more. Um, so just get them in the car. So, you know, generally speaking from, from like a snake bite, um, you know, if, if a human were to be bitten, the bite is, you know, kind of bitten here or, or wherever they get bitten. On dogs, the nose, um, and the only other time I've actually seen a bite was in the lip of a dog. So that's because when they do interact with their snakes, their nose is down. That's how they're thinking about the world. That's how they're, you know, thinking and learning. They're taking it in with their nose. They're taking those smells in, and that's what's kind of snoodling around on the ground. Unfortunately, that's where the snake's head is. So that's where we see it happen. Um, oh, the link appears to have erred um, for our website, but um, the Facebook page is still effective. So definitely just swing me a message on that one and I'll have a look at why the website's not working in a moment. Um, but yes, so from snakes, so snake wise, they basically have a little area that's their safe space, um, whether it be kind of a snake length of, of radius around the snake. Um, snakes have a very fast fight or flight response much like any animal but with snakes there's just not as much kind of I guess uh, insight into that unless you're really interested in snakes and a bit of a snake nerd like myself so um, basically that little radius around them that's their little safe space so normally if we're approaching that's they're gonna start thinking oh like what's going on what do I need to do if we just stop and stay still and stay very calm Normally, that's when the snake's going to go, ah, I'm going to choose flight, and they're going to try and take off. They're very quick. You'll see them one minute, and you won't see them the next, um, and they'll pretty much head off. If we continue to approach, you know, whether we haven't seen them or, you know, anything like that, that's when they're going to start to get their little, their back up, and they're going to think, oh, gosh, you know, we're huge. If you think of this tiny little snake on the ground, and you're a human this big, or a dog, you know, we're a very large predator to them. Um, that's going to cause them to get into, you know, a, a defensive mode, feel the need to defend themselves, and the only thing that they have to defend themselves is their teeth. Um, so that's when they're going to give you a bite. Normally, they're going to give you a lot of warning. They're going to, they're, it's very subtle, um, and if you, you know what you're looking at, you can identify it. So certain things that they do, um, you know, they'll hood out their neck and they'll flatten their neck and they're, they're basically trying to make themselves look as big as possible. And they're trying to say, get away, I'm big and scary. Um, is it true that if you make a lot of noise, it will scare them away? Definitely, um, so to speak. So if you're out and about and you aren't quite in its little area, that it's, it's safe space if they're, you know, a little bit further ahead and you're traveling through making noise, they definitely sense that vibration. And that's what they're gonna think. There is a big something coming. I'm probably not going to hang around to watch it and they're going to take off. So they're feeling the world through vibrations and through scents and through smell and things like that. Um, their eyesight isn't amazing. Um, so generally they're more going off their vibration that they feel in their jaw and also in their tongue. So that when they're flicking their tongue out, they have a special organ kind of in the top of their mouth that is connected to their brain. And that's basically taking particles in from the environment around them, pheromones, things like that. And that's then telling their brain what they're seeing. So that's gonna keep them, you know, knowing, oh my gosh, something huge is coming, I'm gonna go, or something's in front of me that I can eat because they can sense that it's small enough and they can, they can basically, you know, see what it is through their different senses that they have. So, if we are making lots of noise and we're approaching and we're, and we're walking around, it's definitely going to deter them and they are more likely to head away. 
but just keeping in mind as well that it could you know make them a little bit more scared and they're going to be a little bit more flighty so that's when they're going to go ah, and they're just going to take off um, they're not the smartest in terms of knowing where the safe area is to take off and they're just going to go um, so that's when we hear people say oh, I got chased by a snake um, it's more them just thinking oh my gosh and they're just going to try and take off so um, oh we're heading like along for time so basically just if you've got any questions please definitely pop them in the little question section there um, and I will try and reply to you as best I can. Um, and if you even have any questions later on, if you're watching this um, when it's recorded um, or anything like that, by all means, send me a message on Facebook and I will be sure to get back to you. Um, and we will find out you know, more about snakes. But basically, um, if everyone's tuning in to just kind of get a rundown on the dog training and things like that, um, it probably would be easier if I have a, if I send through information to you. So if you're interested in the dog training kind of component of snake avoidance, send me a message um, and I can and get all of that information to you uh, as soon as I can. Keeping in mind it's very busy at the moment with COVID and everything, so we'll, we'll, we'll respond when we can to you. Um, but yes, keeping lots of noise um, is a good way to keep snakes away, um, so to speak. But because of their little safe area and their little safe zone that they have that they need to be, you know, kind of safe around. If we approach them or if a dog approaches them um, or something like that, that's when they're going to get their back up and that's when interactions are happening. So there's a fantastic video, um, I'll have to find it and share it on my page, but of a snake catcher in South Australia, I believe. Uh, who released a brown snake. So brown snakes, um, you know, very renowned of um, putting on a really big show. Their um, scientific name essentially means false cobra. They come up and they, you know, they do their little um, thing at you and they'll, they'll launch at you and they'll kind of try and get you to back off. But basically, if you start making a lot of noise, that's when they're going to think, oh my gosh, I need to look really big and scary right now. And then as soon as the person stopped moving he just went back down and just went on his merry way so you know keeping that in mind that they're trying to bluff you as much as they can they don't want to waste venom on something they know is huge and there's no chance that they're going to be able to eat it you know if food might come along 10 minutes later and they they need their venom to take the prey down as well as to help digest it and and do all these other bits and bobs with it so yeah but we've kind of starting to get into our question times. If anyone's got some questions, pop them in there. That would be fantastic. But yeah, so this summer season, we're heading into, I guess, so to speak, it's a late season, um, just because we've all been allowed out a little bit later than, than normal. So just keeping in mind over the hot weather, uh, dogs and definitely depending on you know the breed that you've got and things like that they are very susceptible to the heat so making sure that you've got lots of water around for them um, if they're lucky enough to be inside aircon fans things like that for them um, and just make being mindful in the summer to not walk them during the hot days as much as they're you know carrying on and and you know really wanting to go for a walk they don't know that they could potentially um, go into heat stress so good ways to keep them interested and activated um, in the summer without needing to take them out for a walk is keeping their brains engaged so if you're keeping their brains engaged uh, inside with food puzzles um, things like that that's basically as good as a walk as you could give them so I'm a massive fan of in summer obviously taking them out for their exercise um, when it's appropriate so when that the ground's nice and cold for them to be able to walk um, and not burn their pore pads um, but products like Kongs so they're like a food puzzle that you can stuff their kibble in um, you know put safe peanut butter or um, you know anything like that there's some fantastic recipes online for um, quite intricate stuffings you can put in the Kongs and the dogs will just spend time, um, you know, chewing away at those as well. Um, and that's fantastic because it'll work their brain pretty much better than a walk is going to work, work their brain as well. So um, just another question here from Tom. 
It says, can you please repeat the safest times of day to avoid snakes over summer? Um, so yes, there's definitely times to avoid snakes over summer and there's definitely times they're more likely to be out and about in the summer. Um, and that is, if we've got a nice hot day, it's in the morning and at night, is or heading into the night, is when we're gonna see our snakes active, uh, so to speak. They don't like that peak heat that you get during the middle of the day. If it's, you know, 30 plus degrees, they can't deal with it either, <laughs> like us. So they'll they'll be hiding away, you know, somewhere nice and cool, under a rock or, a, you know, under a house, um, hopefully not, but things like that. Um, and then when it's nice and cool, but the ground is still warm, they're going to come out then to soak up the heat and things. So that's when we see snake bites happen or interactions with snakes. That's when we see people see them a lot. But early morning when the sun's kind of, you know, shining right on a rock or something, they'll come out and bask. They're using that external heat to warm their body and get their metabolism going and, and get them, you know, their body moving. So definitely those times are the best to be vigilant. Obviously, unfortunately, that's the times that we're going to be at as well. So when you are walking your dogs at those times, please be vigilant and just make sure, you know, you've got them on a lead because then you've got your eyes on them. Um, the biggest thing we hear from people when they're coming in with their snakes, uh, but sorry, their dogs that have been bitten by snakes, they'll, you know, we, we hear it a lot and it might be that, um, you know, my dog is, you know, fantastic at coming back to me, has great recall, but he, he wouldn't listen to me. Um, and it's because they're just so fixated on the snake that they're thinking, this is amazing, this is so fun, this thing's moving and I'm chasing it and their prey drive switched on. Um, so if you have them on a lead, at least you can act, you can physically pull them away um, if you see one. Yeah, perfect. And a question from Beck is, if we see a snake when out on a walk, what should we do? Um, so the best thing to do if we do see a snake is as hard as it is, is stop. <laughs> if you see a snake and it's a decent area in front of you, just stop, hang, you know, a few minutes and just watch it. You'll probably find that he'll just continue on his merry way uh, wherever he's heading off to and that way the snake's just going to travel on and not feel threatened and you're going to feel safe knowing that he's gone. Um, if you can and it's safe to do so, you know, very, very slowly just you know, take a few steps back, just walk back really slowly. Obviously keeping an eye on the snake just to know he's not, you know, thinking he's going to travel off past you. And that way then you're keeping an eye, but you're keeping your distance. It's all about knowing that you are just respecting that area that the snakes have around them that they feel safe in. So if we're staying well away from that, they're probably just going to go on their, on their way. If we do see some that are coiled up and they're basking and they're, you know, they're soaking up that heat, whether it be from the sun or from the ground. They're generally snoozing or, you know, whatever they're doing. Again, just, you know, walk away really slowly, just back away and just head back the way you came. Leave him be, you know. He doesn't need to be disturbed. Just, just you know, move on by and the snake will pretty much not be fussed. Yeah, he'll just keep doing what he does. They aren't very fussed unless we're you know, causing something like an interaction or anything like that. So moving nice and, and calm movements. If we start freaking out um, and going, oh my gosh, there's a snake, and we start stomping around, um, like we talked about before, it's those movements and those frantic movements which are going to get them alert. They're going to feel that and they're going to think, ah, no, I don't like any of this. And that's when they're going to start, you know, getting quite scared. Um, a really good kind of um, thing I like to parallel it to is if I, you know, if you're working with animals and things like that, whether it be a horse, whether it be a dog, cat, um, bird, anything like that, if you freak them out enough and you get them in a really harsh state and they're very terrified and you back them into a corner, whether it be a dog or anything like that, they just want to get away and they will do whatever they can to get away from you, whether it be bite you, run away kick you, you know, things like that. They're going to try their best to just get away and save themselves. So processing that and then transferring that into the idea of a snake is they're going to do the same thing. They're just trying to think, oh my gosh, I need to get away. I need to not be here and they'll do whatever they can. 
So if we can stay away from them, respect them, but stay away from them, generally speaking, we're not going to have too many issues. But um, it's normally when the interactions are quite um, close and we get our dogs very reared up, that our snakes very reared up, that's what happens. Um, Wonderful. So yeah, feel free to rewatch the talk um, or anything you've missed or if I haven't touched on anything um, that you would like to talk about or there's a little bit of, um, you need a bit more information on something that I've touched on here, by all means, um, there's a link in the comments to the Facebook page for Canine Snake Avoidance Victoria. Um, that is my business. So just swing a message through to there. Um, or email as well, which is available on there as well. Send me a message um, and, you know, whether it be a photo of a snake and you just want to know what it is, um, a cute photo of your dog, I love cute photos of dogs, um, or questions in terms of bookings, definitely send me a message. Um, keeping in mind, we are fully booked up for the rest of the year, so it's, it's a crazy year. And um, we're very, very busy. So I have a snake in an enclosure right below me and he's trying to say hello because the sun's starting to set and he's hungry. So, um, yeah, wonderful. So that is perfect. Thanks everyone for who tuned in today and, and left um, questions. I might just have a quick read through those questions again and um, we've got a few more minutes so I'll just touch on a few things that um, anyone might have missed if they are joining a little bit later. Um, so there's signs near the creek um, in the Moreland area that say to watch out for snakes between October and April. Um, so, and then he's saying, so you're saying to be alert all year round. Um, and I definitely do be alert all year round. Obviously this time of year, we need to be more alert um, during that October to April is where our snakes are quite active. Whether it be October where they're, um, you know, just kind of finishing up and they're breeding um, and then April when they're, they're moving about um, having their babies and things like that. Um, that's when we see them traveling around a lot, um, whether it be to find food or to find a mate, um, to find an area to have their babies um, as well. So a little um, interesting thing that we find. So the big four kind of main four elapids that we find around the Melbourne, Victoria area, um, our tiger snakes, we get red belly black snakes, um, we get copperheads and we get eastern brown snakes. Depending on your location will depend on the snake. Um, each snake, um, we do get some others, but they're the, the main ones to keep an eye on. Each snake kind of have their own um, niche, so to speak. So they're an ecological niche that they fit in with best. And through, you know, years of evolution and things like that, they all kind of slot into their own little spots. So different snakes like different environments and that's where you're more likely to find them. But there's still um, places like creeks, uh, water sources that they're all going to come through to have a drink. But you, know, you do find snakes like your red bellies, for example, close to water sources, sometimes a bit more often than others. They do like to eat frogs and things like that. So um, versus yeast and browns, which are like mammals and things like that a little bit more. In saying that, they'll eat everything. <laughs> um, they'll eat each other. They'll eat your blue tongue uh, that lives around the area as well. So a bit of a misconception that if I've got a blue tongue in my yard, I won't have snakes. Um, I've seen, you know, three blue tongues and a tiger snake curled up under a piece of tin together. So they definitely will kind of live together in harmony, so to speak, if resources are available. So if there is plenty of food around for all, they might be a bit more inclined to hang out together. Uh, however, once those resources start to deplete, um, whether it be through drought or um, human interactions, so different you know, housing estates and things like that going in, um, they will essentially, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, so to speak. So your blue tongues will eat smaller snakes, um, but at the same time, your snakes will eat your blue tongues as well. So it's a little bit of a myth that you'll have them around uh, if you've got your bluey, you're safe, um, so to speak. But, you know, in saying that, you, you can find both in, in similar areas. So... Um, that's something always to be aware of as well. 
um, many times that we hear that you see the little tail of a blue tongue and it, it looks a bit like a snake. So um, perfect. Well, that's We're almost out of time tonight. Um, so yeah, feel free to contact me um, or even the library if you've got um, you know any other questions about anything that um, in terms of what we talked about today. Um, so and those the emails are both in the comments, which is perfect. So that is great. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined and, and asked questions. It's been uh, really lovely to interact with you in person instead of you know um, kind of messaging later. So. Um, that's fantastic. Just having a quick look through, uh, we've got about five minutes left. So just to see if there's any um, other questions that have come through that are worth kind of going over again, just in case you're joining a little bit later. Um, but yeah, so is it true that if we make a lot of noise, it will scare them away? Yes and no. So yeah, if, if we if we make a lot of noise when we see the snake and, and it's, um, you know, we're carrying on making a lot of noise, they're definitely going to feel that and they're going to know that there's something big coming by and generally speaking, they're going to take off. But um, in saying that, it can startle them if we're very close and that's going to set them into thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on? And that's when they're going to need to take away somewhere. So um, just being careful, but definitely making noise if you're walking and you haven't actively seen it. If you're on a path and you're just making a little bit heavier noise with your feet um, can definitely work. So perfect. Well, looks like we're finishing up pretty much now. So thank you everyone for having me today. And thank you um, Moreland City Libraries for inviting me and, and having um, this time today to, to sit down and, and talk about all things snakes and snake bites and snake avoidance training. Uh, I could probably talk for hours about it. It's definitely, um, you know, a, a passion of mine and and a big passion, I guess, in, in terms of knowing that we can train dogs to stay safe um, and stay you know, away from snakes, to be able to identify them um, and know to come away instead of to you know, follow that instinct to go in and, and have a sniff um, is the biggest thing. So wonderful, just double check that we haven't had any late questions come through, but it looks like we're pretty good. Thanks everyone, um, wonderful. Alrighty, we will um, send any messages through and we will reply to you um, as soon as we can. Alrighty, bye. <laughs>